Generalization of the scala and monumental equation from two dimensions to higher dimensions. We'll see that we so, so let's start with the very classical problem of isometric inhibitions. So, um, we have to write the subset of R and D in the dimension. Then I'm looking for an um, isometric inversion of a given Riemannian metric G. So, G is a finite which which point associates d by d symmetric positive definite matrix in some continuous or smooth number. So I'm looking for isometric immersion into um, the space of k dimensions higher than my, than my space of, of omega. The loop goes from the vector field from omega to r d plus k. And then I'm looking for um, solutions of the system that is really quantitative to be Now let's um, think about the minimization of this problem. So if g the small perturbation of identity. So assume that G is just given as identity plus some small parameter with for convenience, I write two epsilon square, okay, epsilon goes to zero, times A, A is just a symmetric divided matrix. So G is a perturbation of identity. Now let's think that U is also a perturbation of identity having this form. So again, for the calculation convenience, the sort of in-plane displacement Escape by epsilon square w. So w is a field from omega to the same dimensional space R D. Okay. And here I have the transversal dimensions is given by epsilon times V. So V, so V is a vector field with points to R K. Okay. So in the end, U is supposed to be in D plus K dimensional. So D dimensions are indicated here and they many K dimensions. Okay. So now if I make this ansatz, and if I write what is graded U plus was graded U. Turns out very naturally, very easy to be again a perturbation of identity of order x square. There are some higher order terms here, and this leaving order term has this form. So it is twice symmetric, symmetrized gradient of the W plus this expression, this gradient V, transpose gradient V which is similar to the expression in the original system, only that now it is calculated on the, just this out of the dimensional, k-dimensional displacement. So this leads to the following system of PDEs that I call the von Karman system in honor of tensor in the linear elasticity, where v is two and k is one. Um, so, I am given now A, and I want to find which is k dimensional, W is d dimensional, the same dimension. that gradient D times this gradient D, there is a good factor of symmetric gradient W equals to A. Again, as I mentioned, so, um, when D to A1, then one can interpret this W as a sort of in-plane displacement and V as an out of plane displacement, and the system arrives in a way we lost displacement. We have those general setting of D-dimensions, k four dimensions this system and then now let's uh, move forward. So here I have the symmetric gradient W. So in two dimensions, when V is two, K is one. Then symmetrized gradients, okay, of two-dimensional vector fields, constitute exactly the kernel of an operator that is given by kernel okay. Now I can write two by two symmetric matrix. What does it mean to take care, care of it? I'm taking care of each row, which gives me two numbers. And then again, I'm taking the care of this two-dimensional vector, which gives me this color. Okay. that the kernel of this kernel curve domain, two-dimensional domain, So saying that gradient B transpose gradient B, again, D equals two, K plus one, 
differs from the plane by symmetric gradient means equivalently that curl curl of this and curl curl of A are the same. But curl curl of gradient B transpose gradient B is exactly the terminal of Hessian up to a design. We haven't seen this before. This is magic um, cancellation of the third order derivatives, which I have in the left hand side, but there are no third derivatives in there. And this leads, this calculation leads again d equal 2, k equal 1, to the motion per equation. That is, instead of looking at this, I'm saying solve terminal Hessian B equals to minus curl curl A. And in fact, putting you know, the right hand side of this form is not restrictive at all because for any function f better than L1, I can find A in the form of a fixed field, not just a scalar multiplication of identity and scalar functions. Solution of the Poisson equation with the right hand side. Okay. And um, so one more comment here that this this what I call magic cancellation, magic cancellation, the fact that this is equivalent to this, in the sense that I've been describing, is really nothing, nothing very novel. If we remember that the Gaussian curvature of the metric, right, identity plus A, as we've seen on the previous slide, again, this is a two by two base, okay, has the expansion whose highest lowest of the term function coefficient is given by curl curl A. Whereas the Gaussian curvature of identity plus this, which is the full back of the Euclidean metric, okay, the dimensional metric on the surface that is given by as the image of the out of plane displacement given by V, is exactly the Gaussian curvature is exactly given by V. Exactly, but the the lowest of the term are given in terms of the term of Hessian. So what I'm saying here is that the Gaussian curvatures okay, of this metric and the metric given by a sequence or rather a family of surfaces where I displace vertically by means of V should be matched at the lowest order terms. But this goes only in dimension two? This is, yes. Exactly. No, in higher dimension, uh, what do you mean? So Gaussian curvature, what, what, what is it, right? No, 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 this reduction, I mean, it's this, so, reduction, so. this reduction. We will talk about this later. At the moment, this is, that's, that's, that's what I have, right? So curl, curl, I don't know what is curl, curl in higher dimension, but in a sense, of course, I know, you will see later. So, um, so now we get to convex integration and flexibility results. So let me tell you what I mean by flexibility. So let me go back to the system that's II, which is isometric immersion system. The following theorem, there's a long story behind it, but it's final result here with very nice exponent calculation with you to consider an initial Euclidean. And this is the following. Take a metric G okay, with some general D by T case, but co-dimension one. Take a Riemannian metric G and take any C1 U0. Okay, function which points to d plus one, so k is one dimensional, which is a subsolution. So it means that gradient u zero transpose gradient zero is not equal to g as we request from isometric immersion, but it decreases distance with respect to a preferred distance that's given by g. Okay, so this inequality is in a sense of matrices at every x in omega. So means this, left -hand. this matrix is negative definitely with respect to this matrix at each x. So this is what is given. You are given U0. And then the claim is that this U0 can be approximated uniformly by UNs, which are exact, which are isometric immersions, which are solutions of my system of beliefs, with the regularity. So UN can be taken C1 alpha for any alpha which is less than this exponent. Okay, so in other words, you pick U0 which is a subsolution, pick alpha, which is less than this thing, and then approximating C. Now what is this exponent alpha? So this is the minimum of two things. So this beta over two, don't worry, don't write it for correctness, but this is related to, to the um, 
smoothness uh, exponent of the metric G. Really what concerns us is this exponent here. This is one over one plus two D star. What is D star? D star is given here. And this is the dimension of the space of symmetric D by D matrices, right? If I have a D by D matrix, how many degrees of freedom I have? As many as sit above, on and above the diagonal. And that's exactly D times D plus one divided by two. Okay, so this is, the, this is an important uh, number that will show up during the talk. And, and that's the bound for the technique, for the convex integration technique that they employ, which gives the regularity of the so there is some cheating, of course, a little bit here. So there is another assumption that G must be here close to a constant, for example, to identity. Now, in the global case, when I don't have this assumption, then uh, the exponent lowers and worsens because uh, And another comment is that this result holds for any codimension. So in fact, with this exponents. Okay, one can check this one. The same is true. How does the proof look like? That's a deep and long paper, so it's hard to write the proof and explain it in just two lines, but I will try. So you have this U0 and you have G. You look at G minus gradient U transpose gradient U0. And that's a positive definite defect, which I want. So now I want to change, alter, I want to perturb U0 so that this defect at the end of the day vanishes completely. So I'm going to do it in a, or rather, they do it by iterating, by an iterative procedure, in which this defect is at each step is decreased by further and further smaller and smaller quantities. And at the end of the day, the entire defect is done. So because this matrix is positive definite, one can write it, it turns out, as a linear combination of rank one matrices with non-negative coefficients. So the fact that symmetric positive space of symmetric positive matrices, the fact that this space has the basis that's given by rank one matrices of the following. Eta i tensor eta i, this etas are d dimensional vectors, say of length one, that is one information. And another one is that one can do it in a manner that if this matrix is positive definite, then in fact the coefficients here can be written as squares of some, that is, they are non negative. And then there is this basic what's called step construction, in which one perturbs a given first u0, but then this is iterative procedure. So I have u1, u3, and so on, I have u i. Okay? So one perturbs u0 by, by adding an oscillatory function in the direction of the normal vector to the surface that is given by the u that I have at the end, at the beginning of the procedure that is u0. Also, I have some tangential direction. So this is done, and we will see example of such kind of calculation for my theorem later during the talk. Right? But the gist of the technique is that you can add this. You see, this is the frequency is lambda. It's just some large, large number. So this is this gamma is an oscillatory function, and the amplitude is one over lambda. So you are adding oscillations in such a manner that the new u gradient u transpose gradient u differs from the old gradient u transpose gradient u by means of, at the highest, at the lowest order term, one object like this, that is a positive scalar times eta tensor eta. That's why I have those etas here. Plus higher order terms, which constitute an error. But this is just an error which is smaller than the original deficit. So you iterate this construction, and at each step, basically, you are annihilating, you are killing one rank one um, component in the defect that you want to annihilate at the end of the day. Okay, so that construction and proof is by just think, remember this proof is by adding one dimensional perturbations and each one dimension, one dimensional per perturbation, meaning just points in one dimension direction, and with the purpose of 
annihilating one rank one component in this um, expansion, finite linear combination, which gives me the deal. Now, what can I say about flexibility for the for the from Karman system? So I have gradient V transpose gradient plus symmetric gradient W equals A. That's the von Karman system in dimension two. This is result that I put in the some years ago, and it goes as follows. Very similar to the previous result, to the, to the statement. To the statement. Okay. So I'm starting with a given A, and I have V0, W0, a pair of Gaussian functions. V0 points in one dimension. W0 is, uh, this is like an out-plane display, out-of-plane displacement, this is in-plane displacement. Okay. And it is a subsolution in the sense again of negative determinant. So then this V0, W0 can be uniformly approximated with V and WN, which are exact solutions to this problem. And uh, I can do it with the regularity up to exponent alpha, which is exactly ca calculated the same as here. But now D is two, so D star is three. So one over one plus two D star is one over seven. Okay, so this was my or our previous result. Here, global and local case is, uh, is the same. And obviously this result holds, again, dimension two or any co-dimension with the, with the same exponent. So how is the proof working? Again, proof works by adding one-dimensional perturbations. So similarly as what I, what I mentioned on the previous slide, but I look at the deficit, positive definite. I decompose it in one um, primitive deficits. And then I add now to B and to W one-dimensional perturbations. You see this guy just pointing in one direct one dimension E3, which is the orthogonal out of plane direction uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this problem, in order to annihilate uh, one of this uh, each of these young deficit components. So a corollary out of this result is theorem that we very much. So that's a flexibility for the Mojampere equation. If you remember that uh, this um, this step can be interpreted on a simply connected dimensional de domain as a Mosh uh, formulation of the Mosh Ampere equation. Then we have the following. So, given any f, of course, whether like this regularity is just to give an example of the result, right? Um, you can do better than that. Then uh, you take alpha less than 1 over 7, and then the set of C1 alpha solutions of this problem. Is dense in the set of continuous functions. Any continuous function, any V0, can be uniformly approximated by C1 alpha with a chosen alpha less than one over seven solutions to the separation. This statement has been actually improved uh, by Cohen and to alpha less than one over five, where um, the fact that dimension two is crucial, the dimension B plus two is crucial. Analysis methods and conformal uh, invariance of two-dimensional metrics. Um, then also the rigidity side of the story. I don't have to discuss it. So basically, alpha is bigger than two over three. Then this cannot happen. Now let's go to another flexibility result um, for the system of isometric immersions where the dimension is D, right? The first system that I showed you, dimension is D, but now arbitrary dimension and arbitrary co-dimension. So this result due to Allen many years ago. And I stress that his result, which now I will introduce, works for K, which is very large. In particular, k must be bigger than d star cube. So when d equals 1, there is no result in color of anything small. 
So he takes K large enough, and in particular, even the most local construction requires K to be bigger than 2D star co-dimensions. Okay, so this thing is not due to because it's isometric immersion, and then you have you know you have to localize the problem and so on. No, even the basic step, okay, whatever it means, requires 2D star co-dimensions. So what does the result say? It says that if you take alpha, any alpha less than one, and if you take k sufficiently large for dimension sufficiently large, then what I was explaining previously holds. In the sense that if you tell if you have a subsolution u0, then there exists a sequence of C1 alpha with that chosen alpha. You remember before I couldn't pass in codimension one the exponent one over one plus two d star. Uh, but now I can take anything less than one, okay? and then there exists a sequence of u ends with this regularity converging uniformly with you know, which are exact isometric dimensions of G. How is the, how does his proof work? It's very beautiful, deep, complicated proof, but just to compare it, one ingredient in comparison of what I was telling you before is that proof works by adding pairs of one-dimensional perturbations. This is why he requires k to be at least, I mean, it's much larger, but even in the basic lemma, it must be bigger than 2 this star. Because, well, one takes, one looks at the deficit. <laughs> Decomposed mm -hmm. round one primitive deficit, and then to annihilate each of these round one primitive deficits, he uses two co dimensions. Basically, he adds perturbations in your inductive definition of approximating sequence, okay, which are of the form of again oscillatory perturbations, sines and cosines, looking in two different directions, which are orthogonal to the tangent space at a given point of the surface given by the previous U. So to annihilate each one-round one deficit, one needs to use two co-dimensions. And in order to annihilate the full one, you need two stars. Okay? So that's the that's current result. And here is uh, the main result of this talk. Um, so here I... Uh, I prove a theorem of flexibility for the non the isometric immersion, but the von Karman system, which is interesting. And it says the following. So if you take A, and if you take V0, W0, such that it's a subsolution, here arbitrary dimension and arbitrary co-dimension, no restriction that K has to be bigger than something. It can be one, it can be anything. Okay, then you can do the Full flexibility result up to the exponent, which is one over one plus two d star over k. So see, this is very nice because when k equals one and d equals two, then I get the generalization of my previous result for the motion there. On the other hand, when k equals one and d is arbitrary, this is consistent with the count. With the calculation in Conti de Lelis Shekelihidi for the isometric immersion problem, which is really the you know fully nonlinear, if you want, version of my system here. On the other hand, when k goes to infinity, then this thing goes to one. So for any alpha, I find k such that I have uh, the good uh, flexibility approximation. So therefore, this is. Um, also consistent, and one can say it quantifies, although the proof is very different, but uh, in a sense it quantifies the result of Kalen for K, which is very large, because uh, well, Kalen has all the results of K, which is very large. So not only I quantify this result, but I also cover the intermediate uh, dimension range uh, between one and the large, large thing that was needed in Kalen. And here the, and the, the proof, I'm going to finish the proof, um, is based on the explicit construction the yeah, nash kolber scheme, based on one-dimensional perturbation. Like in the isometric immersion problem that I showed you on the first slide, like in my proof on the, with Pazat on the Mojamber equation, two-dimensional, but not like in Kalen, who uses two co-dimensions, two co-dimensions to 
k1 diffusive, I will have just one dimension. So this is one, one dimension of the equation. So outline, this was just the introduction, outline of the talk. I tried to sketch the proof of flexibility at this exponent range. Then we will get to what um, was alluding to so, uh, in the direction of formulation of the Mojan pair system, whose weak formulation is exactly this von Karman system for arbitrary D and K. We will write as a corollary flexibility for this Mojan pair system. We will interpret this new system of PDE. I, mean, I call it new because I didn't see it in any. Um, you know, in any paper uh, that I know of. So we can also interpret this system um, in giving its uh, its uh, proper differential geometric meaning. And if time permits, but I don't think so, so you can ask me privately. Uh, I also have an application of all this to the so-called quantitative of linear and dimensional films, which really in uh, so in essence, when D is two and K is one, that was the reason why we got interested in this problem in the first place. Okay, in that equation. Okay, so are there questions at this point? Sorry, I have a stupid one. I, I lost the D star. What was the D star you defined? D star is um, D times D plus one over two. And so that, that's the dimension of the space of symmetric D by T matrices, right? So that's what I'm saying. You have D by D matrix, you just look how many guys you have them on and above the diagonal. This is D times D plus one divided by D. So that's it. Yes, I mean. So the reference configuration, is it correct to think of it always as a plate? Mm. Or, or can that be curved too? Oh, but here there is no reference configuration. That's just yeah, the I mean the, o yeah, the omega that you found. So I mean if I have to in the way that the carbon system yeah, it's, it's, it's for a plate, but is it really restricted to being a plate or it just be like D is the dimension of a reference surface? So yes, yes, but then you have to pause what what you have to pause a question well. I mean, what is the PDE that you are solving and what is its significance? So for exactly. yeah. so so it could be a shell. I mean, there's a significance would be you have a curved shell and you're trying to uh, deform that shell itself. So that, but that's not my, I'm not talking, I'm just saying in the setting that you're considering, I should always think of it as a place. Exactly. exactly. No. But, um, you know, if you if you are in the context Maybe we can we can discuss it later. So I'm very aware. I've written many many papers and had a whole research program on this dimension reduction of thin elastic shells with pre strain. So if you think of a shell with a pre strain that you can do the pull back of everything, you can put the reference configuration, which is a thin plate, and then the pre strain metric just changes. So the problem is equivalent. Okay, that's what. We're doing. Okay. You have questions? I'll we'll just ask at the end, I think. <laughs> so that's the outline of the talk. Let's start the talk. So the main technical ingredient in proving my theorem, the following what I call stage compression. Okay. Well, calculation here, but it's really the essence of the technique. Those of you that don't know, so um so you have a and you have B and you have that some better regularity than before, C2. And now you look at the defect. The defect is A minus this expression. Now I claim that I can find Vt, so fix sigma, and fix M, which is basically like the second derivative of the real gap. <coughs> so then there exists V tilde and W tilde. Such that I'm going to say what are the bounds on the first and the second derivatives of V tilde and W tilde, and what are the bounds for the new deficit that is this A minus this expression, but now from Karman tensor now calculated on V tilde W tilde. 
So I can perturb, if you want, BLW to be BLW to BLW, such that the following happens. In C1 norm, they are close to each other, as close as the original defect, which I assume to be small, right? allows for um, here. Now, the new deficit is much better. Oh, it's OK, forget this term is not really relevant for this discussion. But the new deficit is the old deficit divided by sigma. So I am able to decrease the deficit by a factor of a prescribed sigma, which is bigger than 1. But then the price to pay for this is the increase of the second derivative, LV tilde. And w by the factor of this sigma to power the magical exponent this term of your k. Okay? So this is the essence and the main technical argument. Now let's see, provided I have this, and then I'm going to walk you through the proof of this. Provided I have this, how do I get my final result? And the, the k here is arbitrary. There's no like. Yeah, this is a completely arbitrary case. Yeah. Once again, I want my my objective is to dec decrease the deficit, and here I say I can do it by <laughs> any one hundred any large number, but the price to pay is that the second derivative will be increased by this large number. <laughs> positive power, d star over. Let's see how, assume now, so this is the, the general theorem. It says, assume that the statement S in this is called theorem stage holds. I don't want to write d star over k, holds with the power gamma. Okay, so it means I decrease the deficit by sigma, but the price I pay is the second derivative blowing up, increasing by sigma to power gamma. Okay, whatever, whatever I was able to find. Uh, so it says that then there exists V tilde, not the same as before, V tilde and W tilde, which are close to the original V and W in the C1 node, which are of C1 alpha regularity and which are exact solutions. Okay, that's, that's remember, remember, that's what I want, right? I want V and W, which are close to V, I mean tilde, which are close to V and W, they are exact solutions. So this is achieved by iterating the previous construction. You start with V0 and W0, which is the given V and W here. Okay? And then you iterate what you had the, the theorem stage. And you observe that, first of all, at each step, the second derivative is increased by sigma to power gamma. So by n steps, I increase by sigma to power gamma n. On the other hand, the difference and what happens to the, to the first, the C1 norm, right? The C1 norm at each step is bounded by the previous defect to power one half. But the defect, right, the previous defect to power one half, but the defect at each stage, right, at each iteration step is decreased by dividing it by sigma. So this guy is one over sigma one half of and minus one. So I have a bound on the second derivative. I have the bound on the first derivative. So by interpolation, I have the bound on C1 alpha. No. So C1 alpha, okay, so C0 alpha on the gradient, interpolates between C0 alpha norm of the gradient, interpolates between the gradient and the C0 norm in this fashion. There is alpha, there is one. I put this together and I get sigma to this power. Okay, so gamma comes from here, there is gamma n, and I have some n half coming, uh, coming from here, okay, and I have alpha. So now I want this sequence to be Cauchy in C0 alpha to converge, and therefore this can be achieved when this power, right, sigma is bigger than one, when this, this is one power number times n, when this power is less than zero. And this power is less than zero, exactly for the alpha, which is less than one over one plus two gamma. Okay? So you see that improving gamma, that is having uh, you know, a smaller gamma, 
uh, improves the result. So now I'm going to show you how I get gamma, which is this time. Okay, so it's clear. So um, I don't have much time actually to go through it. Maybe I'll just say now through the slides and a couple of points. Um, so the first what I prepared here is the explanation of this, this defect decomposition. So write the symmetric matrix close to identity, I can write that in the composite in this fashion. And then um, V and W, and now I want to find V tilde and W tilde such that the new von Karman tensor minus the old von Karman tensor just differs by one element in this decomposition. Something which is say A1 squared, eta1. And uh, I will have to I will have to skip this because we have to go to other things. So that is the way of doing it in optimal manner. So for the V, you will have V tilde, which is V plus perturbation, and you have W tilde, which is W plus more complicated perturbation. So basically, you take what is the perturbation in V, you are adding, so this is amplitude one over lambda, this lambda is large. Then you have A, which is this defect coming up here. A square eta tensor theta, which you want to annihilate. Then you have gamma, which is an oscillatory function, oscillates with the frequency lambda in the direction of eta. And you send this perturbation, you place it in the one co-dimension. So you have a unit vector E in RK. Okay, so this, this is your original original V. And then just you are you are using the co-dimension one. And in W, to match this <laughs> choice of V in W in such a way that uh, that's, that this is what you get. That the new Karman tensor minus all von Karman tensor differs from this by a new error, which is of order one over lambda. So one is large, so lambda is large, so this is a smaller, this is a smaller error. Okay. So uh, so with respect to the previous calculation, that's actually an arbitrary uh, better step lemma. Uh, this error is really so you know respect to what I had or what I had before in the two-dimensional case, uh, that calculation couldn't be done. So you would have to do it in a more manner. So if you have questions, I'll um, privately. And <coughs> What you what is this? What is now this? What is the new error that you produce? You have a term of, of order one over alpha, one over lambda, and there is this a, and a is like the square root of the defect, right? Because the defect is the sum of a i square and the random analysis. So each a is like the square root of the defect. And then you have the second derivative, that's an that's a equation, second derivative of the old v that you are preparing here. And then you have only terms of order one over lambda squared. And what you see here is either gradient A tensor gradient A or second gradient A. And A is, in the, is the square root of the coefficient in the decomposition of the product. Basically, now let's look at this calculation. So what happens in one step like this? The V, what is the V tilde, what is the perturbation, the measure of perturbation in C1? Okay. So C0 is of order one over lambda, but then if you take one derivative, then uh, this lambda here, right, comes, comes out, so cancels with one over lambda, and the order is like A, but A is like the square root of D. That is what I was showing. <clears throat> On the other hand, now the second derivative, right? Two lambdas come down here. This is of order lambda times a. So now, if you do it many times, if you do it d star times, right? You need to do it d star times in order to annihilate each of the d star primitive errors in the decomposition of the legacy. Then the difference, then the C1 norm remains closed by, okay, by 
x 24 square root of b. But the second derivative blows up like lambda to power d star because you apply this construction d star time. So this is when I only use one co-dimension, this with k equals to one. That's why you have lambda to power d star price to pay in the increase of the second derivative. But now this is a very natural observation that we have more than one co-dimension at hand. So maybe we can annihilate the primitive uh, parts of the defect all at once using more co-dimensions. So this is what we do, in fact. We define V tilde and W tilde as V and W plus perturbations. Now I'm using all K codimension um, elections in the same manner as before. And I noticed that they, they actually do not interact with each other in a manner that does not preclude the so the new von Karman minus the old von Karman equals now to the to all the lowest order deficit that I want to calculate. Okay, and I am introducing here new error term, which is of order one over lambda times the second derivative b of the cap, and one over lambda squared, one over lambda squared, and just the same type of terms that I've seen. So here is now the plan. And what we can do. We can try to cancel k primitive deficits all at once using k codimensions. If this k happens to be bigger than d star, okay, then I can cancel all d star first order primitive deficits. And I can proceed to cancel second order deficits because I still have some codimensions at hand available. If I say I already canceled everybody, this is if this was going up to the star, this is exactly the, the, the composition of my original defect. I can cancel all of these defects, of course, at the expense of the error there, but I still have some codimensions available. So I can proceed to cancel second order deficits, which are obtained as the primitive decompositions of the error of those error terms that I in my original cancel. And then I can, if k is very huge, I can cancel even higher order deficits, adding each time k tuples of single codimensional codimension perturbations. And in fact, I'm going to do it for a number of steps, which is the least common multiple of k and d star. So let's see how this works. Okay, so this is some uh, tedious calculations here, but basically, um, maybe let's look at this picture. So I, I declare capital N to be the least common multiple, K, which is the codimension, and D star, okay, which is the number of the one-dimensional defects that I want to cancel. So this is capital N. And then I am performing in one stage construction this many steps. One, zero, to N. So at each step, I update my frequency with which I add, which is the frequency and measure inverse amplitude of the perturbative one-dimensional, uh, well, oscillations that I, that I use for the purpose of canceling the primitive deficits. Okay? Here's really the, the key point for this to work, that over each multiple of K, that is when I, then I said, when I reset my procedure over each multiple of k, the frequency is multiplied, is increased by, okay, so original frequency is say, lambda, so then I will get over each k, and I multiply it by another, by another lambda. Okay. So whereas over each multiple of this star, okay, so this star is, this is, this is when I, when I pass this star, it means I canceled all the first order, all the primitive deficits in one single deficit. And then I start to cancel the next order deficit, and the next order deficit, and so on. So passing over each D star, I have to update the frequency by multiplying it by another power one half. Okay? So, um, yeah, so this is the preparing the data. There is a certain multiplication procedure. I'm updating the frequencies. I decompose the defect. Of course, the defect uh, B, B, the defect, it doesn't have to be positive definite. So, 
three things all we have to we have to add to W and multiple of identity so that this new difference is both controlled and positive definite, and then you can decompose the deficit. And um, then you have a bunch of inductive estimates. There are actually three induction procedures which play with each other so that at the end of the day, uh, you get that you see over each. Um, over each multiple of k, the derivative, so let's say when m equals to one, that the, the second derivative of v is increased by one power of lambda. Whereas the deficit over each multiple of v star is decreased by one power of lambda. So in conclusion, and of course I have to go in, the, in, this, uh, in this proof to, not, not just the second order the derivative second higher order derivatives as well because they contribute impact to the derivatives of the deficit which I need for the derivatives of a which I need for the derivatives of b okay so this is a convoluted procedure and in conclusion you remember that I perform n steps and n is a multiple both of d star and k so after performing all the steps, the second derivative increases by a factor, which is the power of lambda. And this power is the number of k's that I, that I have in my stage. Whereas the d decreases by the factor, which is the power of lambda, which is that this power is the number of stars that I have in my study. Because over each passing each B star, I am decreasing by one over lambda, I am by, by, by lambda, whereas over each K, I am increasing by the factor of one. But, you know, this, uh, the number of, um, the number of Ks, so N is the least common multiple, right? Uh, of K and B star. So the number of Ks and the number of B stars the ratio is the same as d star over k. So this, so the measure of this increase versus the measure of this decrease in power is exactly d star over k that I wanted. So in the remaining how many? Five minutes? Five minutes? Yes. I try to explain what this motion passes then. Is the first result for two dimensions? This gave rise to flexibility for the model by equation. Now I have this higher order Kerman tensor, and now I want to add what is the um, in a sense, strong formulation of this of this system, arbitrary dimension of dimension. So this is um, this is how I think about this problem. So Think of a given metric, which is as on the first slide, the perturbation of identity, and compare it with the metric, which is pullback of identity via and now this deformation, which is just given by the outer plane. If you want out of omega displacement in the k-dimensional vertical direction given by v. So now, before on the first slide, I was checking the Gaussian curvature of those metrics. Now I'm in arbitrary dimension D. I'm going to look at the full Riemann curvature tensor, both of this and this. So the linearization identity of the Riemann curvature tensor is given by, okay, here's a certain operator, which I call C2 in honor of Carol Kerr, applied on A, or here applied on gradient B transpose gradient B. And this C2 looks as follows, okay? So that's alternating the table. This is D. I have D to power four um, table of coefficients uh, which are naturally given like this, uh, computed from, from, the, from the formula on the Riemann curvature. Now, C2 on, so the first observation that C2 on this type of perturbation 
It's really well in two dimensions. I had the terminal Hessian, so it also has something to do with the Hessian as follows. Okay, so I will take second derivative of v in the direction, right? So this is a table. So I have four uh, ij uh, s uh, t here. So I take the scalar product of the second derivative in those directions and minus the second derivatives in the alternative directions. So when k equals to one, okay, when, when v points just in codimension is one, then what this thing is, you are writing a second derivative of Hessian matrix. So this is a d by d matrix. And for, e for every quadruple ij st, you take ij indicate two rows, ST indicates two columns, and you are looking at the two by two matrix at the intersection, and you are taking the So when D equals to two, of course, the only possible thing is exactly the determinant Hessian, or uh, I, I just all those I and S, so I, all, you, all of them are the same, so maybe I will get zero. So another now observation is that. Um, C2, right? So C2 is the generalization of that. So C2 is zero exactly when the argument is symmetric gradient on a contractible domain. Right? So this is the same as her, her was zero on the first symmetric gradient with this matrix. So now I'm going to reformulate my von Karman system of PDPs, right? Which is this one, uh, by using the previous observation. So symmetric gradient. This, this um, term here means that gradient V transpose gradient V and A have the same C2. But C2 of A, okay, is, let's call it F, and C2 of this is exactly this bunch of determinants of uh, two by two minors uh, of the Hessian. So those two problems are equivalent, provided that F is interpreted as C2 of A. And the follow those two problems have the following geometrical meaning. So this means that the metric, right, seen on the, on the previous slide, that the metric identity plus epsilon square A and the pullback of Euclidean metric like this. Coincide at the lowest order terms in the Riemann curvature. Whereas this, as I explained on actually the very first slide of my talk, means that V can be matched by higher order, higher order because I write that now, it's expansion of epsilon squared, it's expansion of by higher order in plane field W, so that the matrix not just coincide at the lowest order terms in Riemann curvatures, but really coincides at their lowest order terms. So this is an observation that those two statements um, are actually equivalent, and they are displayed by the equivalence of this and this uh, PD. So we have the following theorem, the corollary of the previous flexibility result that I showed you. So if you take F, and if you take alpha, which is less than this um, component, it's one plus two d star over k. Instead of C1 alpha solutions to this modular pair system that I just described, is either empty, where f is not in the image of C2, or it is actually dense in C0. So every continuous function can be approximated in C1 alpha, can be approximated uniform with C1 alpha exact solution. And one more observation. So when is f in the image of, um, of C2? Uh, you can only if f satisfies certain identities, which are just linearizations of the algebraic and differential DMT identities for the curvatures in the Riemann curvature test. Okay, so one derived directly, and there are some symmetries. Okay, so if you have an arbitrary, in this context, an arbitrary table, a D to power four dimensional table of functions which satisfy both um, those conditions, then for sure you know that you have C2 of A, and then you have a full flexibility result at the uh, of the um, regularity uh, exponent C1 alpha that I indicated. So, um, so that's, that's the final theorem.
Equivalent coordinations, and I thank you for your attention.